Thank you for joining us for the latest installment of our Ask the Expert Vlog. I'm Gary Hammer. I'm the Endocrine Society immediate past president. I am an endocrinologist at the University of Michigan, where I direct uh, the endocrine oncology program in our cancer center. And I specifically specialize in adrenal diseases and adrenal cancer. So welcome. I'm here today with Executive Director of the National Adrenal Disease Foundation and patient advocate, Lori Angler. Welcome, Lori. Hello, Dr. Hammer. I am so happy to be here. 16 years ago, I was diagnosed with primary adrenal insufficiency and really struggled with adjusting to a new way of life. Now with COVID-19, I again find myself with so many questions and just not enough answers. So on behalf of the individuals with adrenal insufficiency mm -hmm. and other rare adrenal conditions, we are so happy you are lending your expertise to answer some common questions circulating throughout our community. What are the most important considerations for someone with adrenal disease right now with COVID-19? And do these considerations change based on the type of adrenal condition? This is a great question. And we're getting a lot of questions like this during the COVID epidemic. It requires an understanding of the influence of cortisol on the immune system and the immune system on cortisol. The bottom line is this, it's cortisol, particularly in terms of adrenal hormones, that is the issue here. When a patient has cortisol in excess, be it exogenous cortisol from drugs like prednisone, dexamethasone, or hydrocortisone, that's excessive, meaning pharmacologic doses of these, not replacement doses, pharmacologic doses, or a tumor making excessive cortisol, be it driven by an ACHH tumor in the pituitary resulting in excessive adrenal cortisol or an adrenal tumor, benign or malignant, making excessive cortisol, that excessive cortisol is an immune suppressant. And you are, you are more likely, more at risk of getting an infection, i.e. COVID. That's very different than physiologic replacement of cortisol from adrenal insufficiency in someone who is on cortisol replacement. Physiologic replacement does not put someone at increased risk of any infection. That's the difference between physiologic and pharmacologic replacement, and that's essential to know. Next piece, what if you are on replacement of cortisol for adrenaline insufficiency and do get COVID? That's a different question. In that situation, just like any intercurrent illness with someone with adrenal insufficiency, if the illness is significant enough, we recommend stress dosing, in quotes, of your glucocorticoid. And depending on the level of stress, we sometimes double or triple the dose, or sometimes, of course, it requires even higher doses of glucocorticoid therapy when someone's in the hospital. Those are the two critical things to know about adrenal disease uh, and either contracting or at risk of COVID and what to do if you get COVID. Dr. Hammer, now that vaccines are more readily available, should individuals with adrenal insufficiency or Addison's disease stress dose or modify their dose at all prior to receiving the vaccine? Right, so I began to address this a little bit in, my, in the, the last question. The answer is no. Uh, consider uh, the, the vaccine, first of all, is not an illness. The vaccine can result in your body mounting an immune response, uh, which uh, sometimes can make one feverish or um, have a fever or even uh, uh, be in bed for a, a, a day. Uh, this is not a huge risk if, of course, you get significantly ill from the vaccine, again, very unlikely, such that you are in bed with a fever, let alone have nausea and vomiting, you would treat that event similar to any illness in the setting of adrenal insufficiency. But we would recommend nothing done prior uh, to receiving uh, the vaccine. That leads to another good question that many are asking is, what are the potential side effects of taking the vaccine that would be unique to adrenal disease patients? Yeah, good question. Really, nothing about potential side effects of taking the vaccine. Um, let's think about it a couple of ways. If someone has 
excessive glucocorticoids on board, be they pharmacologic from pharmacologic therapies like prednisone for a different disease, um, then one is somewhat immunocompromised, um, um, <clears throat> but it doesn't really affect the vaccine potential side effects, although the side effects may be less because you're already, immuno you're, you're already potentially immunocompromised and may not mount as robust of an immune response from the vaccine. So we would recommend that anyone who does have glucocorticoid excess, for example, uh, with an ad a functional adrenal tumor, to have the steroids under well control, have the cortisol controlled before you get the vaccine. Someone with adrenal insufficiency on glucocorticoids, I don't predict any unique side effects from the adrenal insufficiency. What precautions should children with adrenal insufficiency, those that are treated with daily cortisol replacement therapy, consider to prevent complications? So on one level, not much different from what I've presented thus far in terms of what to think about. Um, <clears throat> I think the question may be asking preventing complications from the vaccine versus preventing complications if a child were to get COVID. Um, and I don't, there aren't many unique situations that I'm thinking about in terms of a child with adrenal insufficiency who's on replacement therapy, they again are at no increased risk of getting COVID. If a child were to get COVID uh, on replacement glucocorticoid therapy, for example, uh, one must, one must simply be very aware of the complications that present themselves because those complications may require increasing dosing of cortisol similar to any intercurrent illness. Uh, I don't envision there being a situation where we're envisioning preventing complications more robustly uh, just because the patient has adrenal insufficiency in the setting of COVID, quite frankly. Perhaps it might be worthwhile to just go over some of the key points we've made in this, uh, in this short Ask the Expert segment. The most important points I think to, uh, to have all of us be aware of are the difference between glucocorticoid excess and glucocorticoid deficiency. It is glucocorticoid excess that can result in immune suppression and make one more prone to infection. Two, glucocorticoid deficiency um, with appropriate physiologic replacement of glucocorticoids in someone with adrenal insufficiency does not put one at increased risk uh, of, any, of the infection. What to remember is if someone does get COVID infection and is significantly ill, that we would recommend similar stress dosing of the glucocorticoids as one would do in any adrenal insufficiency patient on replacement steroids. Regarding the vaccine, there is no increased risk of the vaccine and you can view the vaccine as being similar, um, similar uh, to anyone getting vaccine other than that if one does get ill from the vaccine, you would think about that illness similar to an infection uh, and its level of the level of severity of that illness as to whether or not stress dosing would be important or not. Lastly, if someone does have glucocorticoid excess, uh, if possible, prior to getting a vaccine, one might think about getting that cortisol or glucocorticoid under control, uh, if possible, prior to getting a vaccine. Those are the main take home points uh, of today's quick 10 minute Ask the Expert. Thank you, Dr. Hammer. We really appreciate your expertise. And I'd like to let viewers know that they can look for the National Adrenal Diseases Foundation website at www.nadf.us to find life preserving documents, calendar of events, news updates, and support groups. And you can get involved by becoming a member. Uh, joining a support group or becoming a volunteer. Um, we also hope you'll participate in My AI, a patient-centered adrenal insufficiency research project focused on symptoms, diagnosis, quality of life, and outcomes of treatment. All of these great resources and quite a bit more can be found on the NADF website. Um, thank you, Dr. Hammer, the Hormone Health Network for this great session. 
I want to thank you all as well. Uh, and that concludes our segment of Ask the Expert. I really want to take the opportunity to thank you, Lori, and our partners at the National Adrenal Disease Foundation. Um, uh, and Lori, thank you for letting folks know what else is going on with the National Adrenal Disease Foundation, particularly during this Adrenal Awareness Month. Bye for now. <laughs>